Good evening. Uh, this is uh, the Chicago Computer Society South Suburban uh, uh, Computer Club. We're uh, uh, here tonight, uh, January uh, 17th, 2023, for the first uh, uh, meeting of the year. Uh, tonight we have a guest uh, presenter, John Kraut of uh, the Potomac uh, uh, Area Technology uh, and Computer Society. I may have butchered that a little bit. No, you got it right. You got it right. Okay. Well, that's good. Uh, something positive there. And he's going to give us a, a, a two-part series on how to deal with a, a robocalls to try and get these uh, people to go somewhere else and bother somebody else. This is what it amounts to. Uh, I want to bring up that uh, uh, Thursday evening um, is Ed Keating's uh, uh, Northwest Computer Club uh, meeting. He'll probably send out the announcement uh, sometime tomorrow. And then uh, a week from tonight, next Tuesday, is uh, uh, the CCS Lennox SIG group. So uh, we still have three more meetings uh, for the month, and uh, including tonight. And uh, we'll keep going forward, but uh, John will uh, present part two of this uh, uh, presentation uh, next uh, month. On the 21st. <coughs> yes. Uh, if the, uh, Is there anybody uh, with any other uh, business uh, uh, that we should uh, know about? Hearing uh, that? Tim, Tim, there is one thing I that I would like to discuss if we have time at the end of the meeting about Macrim Reflect. Okay. Uh, in that case... I, I don't want to cut into the speaker's time. That's fine. Uh, in that case here, uh, John, I'm going to turn the uh, whole meeting over to you and let you proceed from there. All right. Um, let's see, folks. I'm going to... What I'm going to do, I found the best way to handle this is to get my presentation started and then share it. And then I have to turn off a couple of things that block parts of the screen so you can't read the slides, or at least you can't read them completely. So the first thing I'm gonna do, you won't see this, is I'm gonna start my slideshow. And the very first slide is black. Do not panic. That is intentional. It doesn't mean that you've been disconnected or I've been disconnected. Let's see here, start from current slide, there we go. Okay, black slide is on the screen. And now I'm gonna switch back to the Zoom meeting and I will share it. So you're gonna see a black screen, but that allows me to turn off the things that ordinarily will block your view of my slides. And the first of those things is the video panel oh come on and uh here we go hide the video panel okay and the second thing i have to do up oh, there it started too soon can you see the black bar across the top the middle of the top not really it okay was well there. it was there but i don't see it now okay i'm gonna do hide the floating meeting controls and now, the first thing I want to tell you is that I use QR codes in my presentation. The second thing I want to tell you is this is definitely a how-to presentation. It's not just what is possible, but I'm going to show you step-by-step -step how to accomplish things on your phone to uh, lessen the burden of robocalls. But um, mostly for this presentation, part one, the QR codes are at the end. Not all of them, but most of them. Now... Um, there's a real advantage in QR codes, and that is that you can access the information that is presented that way immediately and without typos. Compared to typing a long URL, you know from experience, and I do too, that the uh, longer the URL, the most, more likely it is that you're going to make a typo, and then you have to figure out where it is and how to correct it. Well, when you use a QR code to access the same web page, that's not a problem anymore 
because you simply scan the QR code and the phone allows you to open the web page, period. As long as it's accurate in the QR code, it'll be accurate for you. And I can tell you that I've checked and rechecked the QR codes in my presentation so I know they're accurate. Uh, if you have a phone running Android 10 or later, or a phone running iOS 11 or later, then your phone can be configured to use the camera app to scan QR codes. And when it sees a QR code, it'll immediately recognize it and give you the option to open the web page or do whatever else is built into the QR code. There is absolutely no need to tap the shutter button. On the other hand, if you want to show it to somebody else, you may want to take a picture of it as well. So you're not locked out of that. Now, if you want to learn how to scan QR codes, I did an uh, APCUG uh, workshop on that. And here's the URL. Now I'm gonna get, uh, before you attempt to write this down, I'm gonna give you, give you an easier way to make a copy of it in just a moment. So just hang in there. Um, in this video, the hands-on how-to education of using your smartphone for scanning QR codes starts at 20 minutes in and ends at 32 minutes and 28 seconds. So it's not a huge investment of your time to go watch that and learn the skill. But now, if you don't know how to do it yet, at least you can save the slides that I show you that include QR codes, or from that matter, the slide that I just showed you that gives you the YouTube video URL. It's a technique that I call save now, scan later. And it turns out if you're using a Mac or a Windows box, or for that matter, even uh, a Raspberry Pi to watch this presentation, you can save any slide you want using a simple keystroke combination. And I will tell you where it shows up when you do save it. So here's the Windows version. Use the Windows key, hold it down and tap the print screen key. It's that simple. It takes about a second for the computer to save the current image that you're looking at. And where will it be saved? It'll be saved in a subfolder under pictures called screenshots. It's a pretty descriptive name. And it uses a sequence number method so that each screen image file that's saved has a unique name. And the, the reason I call it Save Now, Scan Later is because later at your convenience, after a presentation, you can display the screen image file and scan it with your phone. Or if you download a free app for your computer, you can scan it with the computer for that matter. And sometimes it's easier to see the web page if you bring it up on your computer. Okay, for Mac, I want to emphasize I don't own a Mac, but I did research this extensively. You hold down two keys, Command and Shift, and then you tap the number five. And when you do that, the screen image is saved in your desktop folder. Uh, and later at your convenience, you can display the screen image and scan the QR code. And yes, there's free software for Mac that will scan it as well. Um, so here's the slide I showed you previously. You may want to save it now using what I just showed you. And by the way, at the bottom of the screen, there's a reminder, both of the <laughs> keystrokes and where the slide is saved. Okay, now I'm just so annoyed by this little thing that says set up professional audio in audio settings. I've just found out that I can get rid of that. So now it's off of my screen. Okay. Um, so there you are. Save now, scan later is useful, not just for QR codes, but anything that you want to save and look at in the very near future. All right, another black screen, and that's because I have a pretty cool introductory slide transition there that's known as Newsflash. Comes spinning in, and we all know what club I'm presenting it for tonight. Um, I updated this recently for uh, iOS 16.2. It's also up to date for Android 13. So even if you have an older version of the operating system on your phone, many of these techniques will apply. Uh, the thing that it has changed most dramatically is in the uh, Apple side. iOS 15 
did things a bit differently. Um, we're going to talk about several things. Here's sort of the highlights. The scale of the robocall problem, how robocalls impact you, just in case you've been ignoring your phone for a few years. Uh, the goals of robocall defense, and this is very important. I'm going to show you exactly what we're going to do. Past methods to, de uh, to deter robocalls. Uh, these provide a lot of useful lessons. And why do not call.gov, which is a federal trade commission uh, operation, and why blacklists, which are used by various apps, do not work anymore. And there's a very significant reason for that that we need to understand. Uh, tonight, we will definitely show you how to make robocalls stop ringing your phone. And th to do that, we use your contacts as a whitelist. And as you might guess, the term whitelist is the opposite of blacklist. Blacklist is callers known to be scam artists. And whitelist is people you want to talk to. And your contacts list is a perfect example of a whitelist. And finally, in both this part one presentation and in part two, we'll learn the jargon so you can impress your friends. Okay, now we're gonna talk about the scale of the robocall problem in terms of two measurements called volume and dollars stolen. And they're both pretty shocking. Um, back in April, 2019, the Washington Post published an article reporting that the estimated robocall volume in the past month, March 2019, was 5.2 billion with a B. And if you do the math, it turns out you can break it down to how many per second? It's about 2,000 per second. That's a lot, isn't it? Well, compare that idea to the old phrase, a sucker is born every minute, and you can see there's a lot more robocalls than suckers. Okay, now about the money side. The FBI produces an annual internet crime complaint report known as IC3 because of its acronym. And CNN.com reported in uh, October 2019 that the IC3 report for the past calendar year, for calendar year 2018, identified, not by name, but this is an aggregate report. 26,379 people reported falling for phishing, which means attempts to convince you falsely that the caller has a legit need for your information, such as your social security number, your date of birth, bank account ID, uh, maybe your ID with your uh, stockbroker and, and passwords and so forth. And those poor people who fell for that lost nearly $50 million to phishing. And that was an average of about $1,900 per person. Some lost more, some lost less. Now, I took a look at the report for the next calendar year. And here's the URL for it. It's still up on the web. I checked that a couple of days ago. And there's a QR code which you can scan now or later, and I provided the same reminders on the bottom, you can make a copy of it now and scan it after you've learned how to scan. And it reported there were 241,342. Now that's a growth of, I think about a factor of eight compared to the prior uh, two years earlier. And the total fishing dollar volume was up a bit $54 million versus slightly less than 50. But because there were more people reporting, the average went down. It was about 224 per person. And I think the story here is that over the next two years, a lot more people found out how to report this to the, the cops, the FBI, I think. Now, after that year, unfortunately, remember this is called the internet the I and IC3 stands for internet. They no longer broke out the numbers for callers uh, who fell for phishing, as opposed to all manner of contact who fell for phishing. 
So it, it's sort of like comparing oranges and apples. You can't do that as much anymore. All right. Now, let's look at it from a personal perspective. How, does, how do robocalls impact you? Well, um, first of all, those of you who have smartphones, you know you've got caller ID. And the caller ID from a number that is usually unknown, or at least it's not familiar to you, shows up on your phone screen when the phone rings. And that displayed number, particularly lately, the last couple of years, may be in your own area code, and even your area code in exchange. What they're trying to do is suggest, falsely, that a neighbor is calling. And of course, with smartphones, the idea that everybody in, living in the same neighborhood has the same exchange number is uh, it, it's just not the case. Um, and I have friends who have received an incoming robocall that literally showed that the caller ID was their own phone number of all the crazy things. That's obviously a robocall. Um, now, the second issue, and this one I found very painful, the robocall voicemails may frequently call, uh, clog up, even if you don't answer, they may clog up your voicemail inbox all the way to its limit, and its limit isn't very big. So people you want to hear from no longer can leave a voicemail for you until you clean out your voicemail inbox. And I find myself having to clean it out twice a week. That was extremely annoying. Uh, and how do, they, how do they take your money? Well, they often demand an urgent reply. They imply to you that you meet, need to respond while you're on the phone or at least very soon that same day. They falsely suggest that they are from the government or your bank or your stock brokerage asking you, perhaps saying that uh, there's been some fraud attempts and they want you to confirm your social security number, your date of birth, your bank account number. Don't fall for it. Uh, often I found they will refer to your social security number as your social. That is a clear indication that they are phishing, that they want to steal your money. Um, and of course, if you give them the information, then they go to your bank uh, or to the IRS to grab your refund or to your stock brokerage and yeah, they can get a lot of money. Uh, now, this has happened to me personally, this last one. They open store credit accounts in your name to buy expensive goods, and of course, they never pay. They take home the fridge or whatever else it is that they bought, and they ruin your credit score. And indeed, that happened to me in 1998. Uh, it wasn't due to phishing. It was because my uh, briefcase had been stolen at a trade show I was speaking at, and it had my passport in it. Um, now, this brings us to the goals of robocall defense. One of the big things that robocallers are counting on is something that all of us baby boomers learned when we were young, and that is, it's fun to answer the phone. So, we got to break ourselves of that habit. And the first thing we need to do is figure out how to prevent robocalls from ringing your phone in the first place. And then we're going to do that tonight. That's actually most of what we're going to talk about tonight. Um, now, the uh, second thing is to prevent robocalls from leaving voicemails for you. So your inbox doesn't get filled at any significant rate. Um, so you can, you know, take that aspect of your life a little bit easier. Uh, Convince robocall systems not to call your number again. Now, it turns out we use the same technique to achieve both of these goals. And that is something we'll cover in detail in part two. Uh, and again, you will know the jargon and it'll make your family and your friends convinced that you know what you're talking about. All right, so we're gonna start with a review of past methods to deter robocalls. The first one is this little box here, and this is the first thing I tried. It was available in the 1990s, 
Uh, I think I probably bought it at uh, Best Buy at the time. And it was sold with a socket to connect to your landline and another socket from the box to connect to your answering machine or your phone. And it was intended to prevent robocallers from disrupting your day or your evening. And what it did to uh, achieve that prevention, it played the three tones known as special information tones that begin every automated message saying you've dialed a number that is not in service. Uh, so that those three tones are recognized by ro automated robocaller systems as an indication that the line is no longer in service. And that means that particular system takes the number out of the dialing system. Telezapper is still available. If you have a landline and you are suffering robocalls in that landline, you can get it off of Amazon. And in fact, its prices come down and it still does the job. Now, the next thing was tried, and this started in the, I think the mid nineties. Uh, do not call that gov was established a website that was uh, created <laughs> and managed by the U S federal trade commission. And it involved a trade-off to get listed as a, uh, a call that was not to be called by businesses having no prior relationship with the uh, owner of the phone number. Uh, U.S. consumers had to get on the site and list their name and their phone number. Now, any cold call, meaning a call from a business having no prior relationship with you, subjects the cold caller to a fine of $11,000 per call. Sounds like a pretty significant disincentive. Okay. The problem is that if you didn't have caller ID, you couldn't identify who called you. And that's what you had to hand the FTC in order for them to pursue collecting the $11,000. And it worked for a few years, at least for those who had caller ID features on their phones. Okay, now blacklist. This is the most significant one. A blacklist is a list of caller IDs, as we said earlier, known to be used by robocaller systems. And for a while, this strategy worked. Um, services such as Verizon, uh, there's an app called Verizon Wireless Call Filter. Uh, there's a, uh, also apps for other firms, uh, one called Umail and another one called Nomo Robo, and all of them use blacklist as a method to block calls from reaching your phone. Now, the bad news is, as you might guess, anytime there's a new challenge, somebody finds a workaround. And indeed, robocall systems found three workarounds. And we're gonna find out what those are. Robocallers now evade do not call.gov and other US law enforcement through three evasion methods. The most significant of which is they relocated offshore outside of US legal jurisdiction. The second one may not be familiar to you. All right, I'm, let's see here. Oh, guess what? The floating meeting controls came back. I have to turn them off again. There we go. Um, spoofing. Now, spoofing allows the caller to send an incorrect caller ID to the person being called, to the recipient. And this has become, the, it, it, it's basically driving services like uh, Verizon Wireless, Call Filter, Umail, and Nomo Robo into bankruptcy. Um, oh, okay. Um, let me go back a step. The third thing was entering the phone network through the service called Voice Over IP, which doesn't attach any legit caller ID or otherwise, anything at all, to the caller. And 
uh, that makes it virtually impossible to trace them. Okay, now spoofing we're going to go into in some detail. Spoofing became technically feasible a long time ago in the early 1960s. And the result of spoofing is that the caller ID displayed by a robocall system is not the number from which the robocall system calls. It's not, period. And what's more, because spoofing works on each individual call, if the caller, if the robocaller system places a large number of calls more or less simultaneously, they can use a thousand different false caller IDs. So there's nothing in the caller ID that will be able to characterize one particular robocall as being related to another one. And it was originally built into the phone system uh, as a response to requests from medium and large size businesses. And that was done in the early 1960s. Um, the idea was that uh, they wanted to give you a single note, a phone number to uh, when you needed to talk to anybody in the company, the master switchboard number. And although anybody who was calling out might be calling from uh, some number that is, let's say, let's say the um, the number that, that you called into uh, ended in one thousand. Well, there might be somebody on on what they call a private branch exchange, the PBX, that has a phone number that ends in nineteen ninety nine. And if you wanted to reach their desk directly, you could call that number. But often they didn't call give it out. They only gave out the one thousand number. You would call that, and then the person managing the PBX, the receptionist, would connect you to the private branch for the person you're trying to reach. It made it easier, from the viewpoint of the companies, it made it easier on the call recipients, the customers, <clears throat> when they were trying to reach you. But it also had no security at all. And anyone with sufficient info, including you, my audience, you can use that switching system server feature. And sometimes it's even entertaining, but I don't recommend it. Now, I'm going to show you why. And incidentally, some of the spoof numbers are actual real phone numbers belonging to other people. Mm -hmm. And I have a coworker when I, when I was working. Uh, one of my coworkers sitting in the same office area that I was sitting in. Um, actually got um, a phone call from somebody who had seen his number as the spoofed number on a robocall and called back just to see what was going on. And he had to say, I don't know, because, of course, he wasn't the person who called to begin with. Um, now, websites exist that enable anyone, including you, to, to spoof their own caller ID when they call somebody. My son did this to me once about six years ago. And there's bad news about this. It's entertaining, but I don't recommend it. Here's why. Spoofing website requires you to put in the number you call from, the real number, and the number of the call recipient. Now, those are two valid numbers right there. And guess what happens? They make a collection of numbers, and they sell them. Now, I can't say it's done every time, but that's the economic incentive right there for operating a spoofing website like this. Okay, so as I implied earlier, robocaller systems now change their spoofed caller ID constantly, which is why you may, over a period of weeks, get the same message from multiple different caller IDs. And none of them are real or at least none of them really put you in touch with the person who called. And blacklists simply can't keep up anymore, period. Sometimes a robocall to uh, one of the larger systems might be able to make a place a thousand calls at a time, and it would literally use 1,000 different spoofed caller IDs, a different one for each call. All right. 
Now, we're going to talk about uh, using a whitelist strategy on your phone so that callers from numbers not in your contacts list will not ring your phone. And this uses a feature that's been in uh, smartphones, both uh, Android and Apple, for a very long time. It's called Do Not Disturb. So, once again, to reemphasize, a white list is, is a list of callers who you want to call you, to reach you. You want to hear the phone ring and you want to answer the phone, or you want them to leave a voicemail. Think of the world of potential callers in three groups, white list, black list, and other. Now, other could be a business or a school or uh, some other organization that in circumstances, occasionally you might care to hear from. But it, uh, if you use a whitelist, they won't ring your phone. Now, what that implies is, it's very important to keep your contacts current and complete. Your contacts list becomes a, a great example, arguably the perfect example of a whitelist. And your smartphone can be configured so that only a caller with a number that appears in your contacts list will ring your phone. And here's a summary of how it works. First of all, you set your phone to do not disturb behavior. Your smartphone allows you to specify exceptions during the period when do not disturb is in effect, meaning callers who call will ring your phone. And as you can guess, that exception is going to be your contacts list. And those calls will ring your phone even when do not disturb is active. So your contacts act as your whitelist. Now, other calls do not ring your phone, but they do light up your screen and they go to your voicemail. If you're lucky, the phone is in your purse or your pocket and you won't see it light up. And you can listen to and respond if the caller leaves a legit voicemail message for you. Um, now, just in case there are there is an occasion when you know somebody is going to call you who's not in your contacts, you can turn off do not disturb easily. And one thing that changed in iOS 16 is it's not so easy as it used to be. We'll get to that. Um, your smartphone allows you to set up a schedule for do not disturb. And what I recommend is setting the, smart time, the start time and the end time to be the same time so that your schedule effectively operates on a 24 hour basis and that way, if you do have to turn off Do Not Disturb and you forget to turn it back on, the automated schedule will turn it back on for you. So the window during which you might receive robocalls is limited. So that's the advantage of a schedule. Um, as I said before, this is a pure whitelist strategy. And we saw this slide previously, I think. I, I would say, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, at the very end of this presentation, I'm gonna show you the history of my experience, starting with the period when I had no protection from robocalls. And you'll see how much things have improved with the various techniques that I've tried. Uh, some people find that a robocall system uses their own number as a caller ID, I mentioned that earlier. It's obviously an extreme approach and it's easily recognized also. You see your own number on the screen, might even see your own name on the screen if your name with your number is in your contacts list, as mine is. And that's easily recognized as spoofing done by a robocaller system. Um, another, another example of how you might um, need to de deactivate uh, Do Not Disturb for a period. I took the cat to the vet, and then hours later I realized the vet was not in my contacts. 
and was going to call me. So I turned turn off Do Not Disturb, and then it got turned back on at 10 o'clock at night when the schedule renewed. So this next section is for Android phones. And following that, I'll show you how to do it in iPhones. In both cases, what you're going to see is a system that allows you to set up multiple schedules. Uh, iPhone with its focus introduction uh, sometime during iOS 15, I think, um, it uh, provided multiple types of schedules. There's a sleep schedule, a do not disturb schedule, and a couple of other things. Um, and with both iPhone and Android phones, it's now possible to set up multiple schedules. Back around Android 10, they introduced multiple schedules. And prior to that, there was just one schedule. So what you're going to find is I'll show you how to do multiple schedules tonight. And if you're using Android 8 or Android 9 or maybe Android 10, you'll only <coughs> be able to create one. But one is all you need to support Do Not Disturb. All right, so here's the Android 13 technique. You open the Settings app, and in the Settings app, you tap Notifications. And you notice as we go through these taps, I'm putting the, the tap path across the bottom of the slides. When you tap Notifications, the notification screen opens, and it looks like this. And in that, you scroll down to Do Not Disturb and tap that item. I circled it here, and the Do Not Disturb screen appears. All right, and there it is. And the last thing you have to tap to get down to getting this stuff organized is Add Schedule, which I circled for you. And so there's your complete tap path to get going. It's Settings, Notifications, Do Not Disturb, Add Schedule. And the new schedule screen opens, and it looks like this. Now, basically, schedule is comprised of four things. A start time and end time, days of the week on which it is applied, and the default, by the way, is seven days, which is good for our purposes. And there's a schedule name. As I mentioned, earlier versions of the OS did not require you to provide a name. The reason they require it now is they allow you to create multiple schedules. I haven't found a need for that, but everybody has their own path. Now, notice the default times. It's not 24 7. It's 10 a.m. to 7 or 10 p.m. to 7 a.m. And I'm going to magnify that for you just in case you can't see it readily. It looks like that. Okay. Now, Notice the schedule name field at the top is blank. That means you won't be able to save the schedule until you fill in a name. Mm -hmm. Now, the things I'm going to show you, you don't, uh, because we're manipulating a schedule, you can do them in any order. You can do the times first, you can do the name first, whatever. But I generally do the time first and then I do the name first. In this case, what I'm going to do is change the end time, which is currently shown as 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. So we tap that in order to change the start and end time. In this case, we'll only be changing the end time. Okay. That last transition is called glitter, and I use that on a, a presentation laptop at my uh, local user group, and it crashed the operating system. And so I was trying to get rid of it from this slide deck, but at least it didn't crash the operating system here at my house. Um, so when you tap those times, a set time pop-up appears. You can see that in the uh, lower right corner. It has a button for the start time and it has a button for the end time. The default is to change the start time. We don't need to do that. So we would tap the end time button. And when you do that, the current time appears below in an area where you can adjust the time. So the selection system contains vertical scrolling wheels, the leftmost one for hours, the middle one for minutes, and the right-hand one for a.m. and p.m. 
So in hours, you want to scroll from 7 to 10. And over here in AM, PM, you want to scroll from 7 AM to 10 PM, or more accurately, from AM to PM. And once you've gotten that end time set the way you want it, tap the Done button. All right. Now, when you make those changes, the new start time and end time appears back in the schedule screen. If it happens you did not make it correct, you can tap it again and change it again. Um, now, I tend to use this name 24-7 in the name field. Once you have filled in the name, then the save button in the lower right corner of the screen becomes active. And what we want to do is tap it. And that saves the schedule. Okay. Now, at that point, that, that screen closes and we're back in the do not disturb right. screen. Uh, this robocall, and all um, the number that you think you're locking out could you please uh, could you please mute your microphone because we can all hear you? Put another phone number, folks. The person who is speaking should mute. ID, but it's not the real. I got him. Thank you. Sorry. Now, after you save your schedule, you'll see its name, and it will say every day for the days of the week, and it'll give you the time frame. And you'll notice I put a. I made a typo when I captured the screen because I had it start at 10 p.m. and end at 10.59 p.m. <laughs> um, but what we haven't done yet is tell the system to make an exception for our contacts list to allow those calls through. So we're going to tap calls, messages, and conversations, which I've circled for you. And that opens another screen, which is called called Calls, Messages, and Conversations. Um, and here's that screen. Now, when you get there for the first time, the default value for calls allowed to interrupt you during Do Not Disturb is all, which doesn't make any sense whatsoever. <laughs> So we're going to change that so it reads contacts only. And to do that, we tap it. And it brings up a menu from which we can make a selection. It looks like this. There was another glitter. I survived it twice. OK, so in the menu, the choices are all contacts only, favorite contacts only, and none. Choose contacts only, which I circled. The check mark will move there, and this pop-up will close. And then contacts only appears as the selected choice under the word calls. There's another significant thing on this screen, and I'll point it out in just a moment. Uh, you can return to the Do Not Disturb screen here, but notice there's a switch called Repeat Callers immediately before below calls. This is a way for a caller who gets your voicemail greeting instead of reaching you can call again, and when the same number calls twice, the phone will let it through if the switch is turned on. And you can see that as a description under the phrase repeat callers. Um, I recommend you turn that switch off because some robocall systems know about this and will attempt to call you a second time within the time period. Okay. Now, um, we go back to the do not disturb screen and We have now set the whitelist, which is the contacts only, allowing to ring your phone during Do Not Disturb. The final thing is to turn on Do Not Disturb. Here I circle the switch. It's at the top of the Do Not Disturb screen. 
And if it's off, it'll be in the left position. You tap it to move it to the right position. And if you are in a situation where you need to turn it off, you can turn it off with that switch and then turn it back on again or let the schedule turn it back on for you. Um, there's one other thing you need to do. Down here at the bottom of the screen, there is a heading called Hide Notifications. So we want to tap that and open the Hide Notifications screen. It looks like this. You may find that some of these switches are turned on. Turn them all off. That's the only thing that makes any sense here. And I'll tell you why. If any of them are on and somebody you want to hear from calls you, your screen may stay blank. You can hear it ringing, but you can't answer it. That actually happened to me the first day I activated this. That was back when I had Android 10, I think. Um, now, as I mentioned a moment or two ago, when you do need to disable, do not disturb. There's the switch at the top of the do not disturb screen. So you know how to find it. Settings notification, do not disturb, gets you to that screen. And then you just tap the switch to turn it off. And as I pointed out, when you have the schedule set, it'll turn on do not disturb at the start time you specify every day. Okay, in Android 8, there was a different way to get to that point called do not disturb. It was through settings, sound and vibration, not notifications. And in case you have no idea where to find it, you can also use in settings, the search capacity, simply type do not disturb into that uh, field and you'll get there no matter where it's hiding. Okay, that's it for Android. Sit back and relax. We'll talk about iPhones. Um, here's the iPhone 16 technique. We open the settings app. We click on the focus item, which I circled for you. And that opens the focus screen. And in that screen, you tap do not disturb. And that takes you to the do not disturb screen, which looks like this. And what we're going to do first is set the whitelist and second set the schedule. So here we are in the do not disturb screen. We tap the word people and the notification screen opens. It doesn't say people, it says notifications. I don't know why, but let's take a look at it. Okay, so here in the notification screen, there is, under the heading phone calls, there is a field called allow allow calls from and here you want to change everybody to my contacts and yes we tap that word and it allows you to see this pop up with four choices everybody which is the worst possible choice allowed people only and that means people you list individually favorites which and i guess there's a way of marking favorites in your contacts uh, app or contacts only which is probably the most appropriate choice. So we tap that and the pop-up closes and now it, it should fill in where the word everybody is. I circled it, apparently I wasn't uh, alert enough to make a second copy of the, uh, the screen. But at any rate, uh, that allows you to select, to establish your whitelist. Now, uh, that screen just below the phone calls also has an allow repeated call switch and you want to turn that off for the reasons we discussed a moment ago for the android switch that does the same thing okay now that completes the whitelist setup when do not disturb is active but now we have to set the schedule and it turns out Back here in the Do Not Disturb screen, you have to scroll down to the bottom of the screen to find the place where you set the schedule. So um, there's one schedule already in place. It allows you to create multiple ones. You do have to provide a different name for each one. And here's the screen that appears when you tap the existing schedule. Now, 
Make sure the schedule button is turned on, but as is shown here. Uh, you also have the ability to create um, select days of the week when the schedule applies, and the default is all seven days of the week, which is a good choice. And then it has separate times for from and to, as you can see. Now, I can't remember what the defaults are. So I captured what I had uh, already installed on my phone. Uh, but if they're not, if the two times of day are not equal, then I suggest you tap the second one. And it'll allow you to use a set of vertical scroll dials like this. You can change the hours, you can change the minutes, and you can change AM and PM. Scroll each dial, and when you're done, you tap outside of that thing, and the new time will appear in the field that you tapped originally. The part that I don't like about this system is how you disable do not disturb. It's no longer a matter of tapping a switch and settings. Uh, in the home screen, you have to open what's called the control center. And what that means is there's a special screen of controls that appears by dragging the upper right corner of the home screen to the center. And there's the control for do not disturb. I circled it for you. The do not disturb control opens. It looks like this in Android, I mean, in, in uh, iOS 16.2. And it doesn't have a just turn off. It has for one hour or until this evening. And then there's a version based on your current location, which means you have to have uh, location services turned on for that to work at all. And uh, I recommend either using for one hour or until this evening. And of course, the meaning of this evening varies because the sun goes down at different times of day and at different latitudes. Uh, so again, I suspect if you use until this evening, it may require you to have location services turned on. Now I generally have that turned on anyway, but not everybody likes to do that, I understand. Anyway, you make a selection here and that will turn off, do not disturb until your schedule kicks in and you'll notice it even says so at the top here, do not disturb on until tomorrow at 12 a.m. So it gives you a reminder of when that will happen. All right, now we're gonna talk about maintaining your whitelist. And this is a little bit easier. <laughs> um, you have to keep your contacts up to date. And here's an example of some numbers that you might not yet have in your contacts list. If you have kids at home or grandkids, uh, you have to inc include your kids' schools, especially the number uh, that automatically dials and reports school closures. Your doctors, your lawyers, your veterinarian, your stockbrokers, your bankers, and the one that nobody can live without, Publishers Clearinghouse. Okay. Now, there are other ways to block robocalls. I've mentioned some of them already. Uh, email is the one that I know most about because its website is fairly chatty about how it does what it does. Uh, since it doesn't charge any money, it's probably supported by ads. And it does two things that are arguably a privacy issue. First of all, it redirects every incoming call to their server farm. Uh, if they recognize a number of uh, calling as being in a blacklist, it plays a special information tones to convince them that they've reached a number that's not in service. You must give your contacts to email. And that means every time you update your contacts, you must give your contacts to uh, email. Calls from your contacts are directed back to your phone. In other words, it treats your contacts as a whitelist. All voicemails are not saved on your uh, on your carrier servers, uh, but on the U-mail servers, U-mail transcribes them and sends them to you as text messages. Also, you can dial into their server number and listen to your voicemails. 
Uh, Nomo Robo, which is $2 per month or $20 per year, claims to update its blacklist every 15 minutes. Not much info is on its website to describe anything else of what it does or how it does it. Uh, since it is blacklist based, and in recent years has suffered the fate of all blacklist blocking apps, uh, it is not, oh, there's a typo, I gotta fix that. Um, due to spoofing by rogue system callers, it, uh, it blocks fewer and fewer of the robocall numbers as time goes on. Basically, it blocks the robocall systems whose owners are too stupid to use spoofing. And there's not many of them. Um, now, this is one that I was asked to comment on for this presentation tonight. RoboKiller, which I've looked at, it is the most expensive one, $40 per year. It uses a completely different way based on artificial intelligence instead of a blacklist to identify robocalls. So what it does is it listens to the first second or half second of each call and it compares the audio to audio of past known robocalls. And if it here, if it finds a significant match, then it can play, it claims the comparison, according to its website, the comparison is completed in less than one second. And that way it can either allow the call to come through or it, it can kill the call. Um, it kills the call when the match is found. Now, I thought this was a very interesting way to eliminate the effect of spoofing on the identification of robocalls. However, I looked at the reviews both on the Google Play Store on the, and the Apple App Store. And I gotta say, this thing has a lot of problems. The current version of the app on each um, store is getting very low ratings. Even if you scroll down the past versions, there are people who had a great deal of trouble with it and uh, reported specifically that it wasn't blocking many of the robocalls. Now, I will admit an AI capability takes time to learn, especially when robocall messaging changes. Um, and, and this is another key part of understanding the, the world of um, robocall systems. Very often the robocall system is operated by a person who does not attempt to profit from phishing. Instead, that person essentially acts as a carrier and is paid by the real scam artist to send specific messages out. Um, and that means that you have to wait for RoboKiller to work. You have to wait until that particular message has been in circulation for a while. And I don't know how long these things stay in circulation. Uh, it may be 24 hours. It may be a week, maybe less than 24 hours. So that's one way that RoboKillers, uh, RoboCallers can work around the, um, the capabilities of the robo killer system. And as I noted, it's quite expensive. Okay. Now we're going to talk for a minute about what you're going to learn in part two. Um, we're going to update your voicemail greeting to convince robo caller systems that your line is not in service. And as you can guess, that means using the approach that's used in Telezapper. After you do that, there's two specific things that you'll experience. One is robocaller systems hang up without leaving a message. And the second one is that each robocaller system that hears those special information tones removes your phone number from the system's internal active numbers list. So they will not call again. Some of them may call again within a year to see if somebody else has been assigned the same number. But as long as you have that voicemail greeting beginning with the sit tones then they will ag again understand falsely but 
that's poetic justice, that your number is not in service. Now, if you think this is a crock, take a look at this experience. In 2018, I was receiving roughly 25 robocall voicemails per week on my smartphone. And they were filling up my inbox. I had to clear out my inbox twice a week. About in, about in June of that year, I started using the Verizon Wireless Call Filter app, which is a blacklist app. And it excluded about 50% of the calls on a given week. So I was still dealing with roughly 12 per week, and I still had to clear out my voicemail inbox every week. Uh, a year later, in July 2019, I installed my custom voicemail greeting. And after eight months of experience, my rate of in incoming robocalls fell to from 12 to two per week. And for me, very significantly, after eight months of experience, my rate of robocall voicemails fell to zero per week. Hooray! So we can do that for you if you will bear with me in part two. Meanwhile, I want to show you a preview of coming attractions, also known as selfless self-promotion or shameless self-promotion. Sorry, I blew that. Um, on this Saturday, the 21st, I am going to present a, a, what is for me a brand new topic uh, called Bluetooth and pairing. So if Bluetooth is a mystery to you and you don't understand why it might be useful or how to use it, this is a very useful presentation for you. And since your club is like mine, an affiliate of APCUG, you are welcome to attend via Zoom. To do that, you send your email request for a guest pass to this address, ffxmtg at padaces.org. You have to include your full name, your city and state, and your user group name. But there's more. Scan this QR code to create the email, and then all you have to do is fill in the blanks for your name and your city and state because I've already put your user group name in the email created by this QR code. So you can save this slide now and then scan it later when you learn how to scan. Okay, there's another opportunity. A week from tomorrow, January 25th at 11 a.m. CST, uh, for the APCUG Wednesday workshop, I will be providing a, pre a presentation on going public with Google calendars. And the advantage of going public is that you can then share the information in each read-only information in this calendar, not only with your club members, but with anybody who expresses interest in learning more about your club. So you can give them not only just a calendar, but each calendar entry can have reminders built in, what we call notifications that will sound off the day before the meeting or maybe an hour before the meeting, reminding them that a meeting is coming up. I think that's a pretty powerful outreach system. So you're gonna learn how to create a digital calendar, how to create and update scheduled meeting info in that digital calendar including repeating meetings. So if you have a meeting on the second Tuesday of each month, you can put that in, for instance. And then how to share read-only access to the calendar with the public. So you can register now using this web page. Uh, this was sent out two days ago by APCUG. Uh, there's the URL and there's uh, a QR code you can scan to go to that web page. Again, you can save now and scan it later. Um, when you do that, when you register, Zoom meeting details will be sent to registered attendees on Tuesday night, January 24th. That's a fixed schedule. So now you know when to expect it. You don't have to get nervous 24 or 48 hours ahead of time, which I do constantly. Okay, that's it. 
Get Ready for Complete Robocall Defense, part two on February 21. And now we're going to end the presentation and you guys can fire your questions at me. Okay. Who's first? Oh, come on. You can't be shy. I figured somebody want to go first. Go. Mr. Pritzel, please go yes. ahead. Yeah, I, I got a, a Apple phone and I tried that thing where uh, it would only answer for people in my address, but I, I turned it back off because I lost a lot of calls from people that weren't in my address because I'm constantly changing, getting involved with other people and it, it it was too much of a problem. So I, of course, now I've been just trying to block all these other calls. Eventually I'm going to have the whole network blocked. <laughs> well, okay. You know what I'm going to say. It's important yeah. to keep your contacts up to date. Now oh, yeah. I have, Admittedly, I have over 200 contacts on my phone. And one of the reasons for that is because every time I get a new phone, all the contacts from the old phone are automatically, I, I have a method to automatically transfer them into the new phone. And I'm not very good about cleaning out people I don't want to talk to anymore, like my old boss. On the other hand, I'm trying to get information out of my old boss for me to get onto Medicare I sent them the, the forms nine months ago, and I know what happened. They sent them straight to the Social Security Administration after they filled them out, because it only takes like eight or 10 minutes to fill out the information. And what does the Social Security uh, Administration do when they get the information from the employer? They tell you right on the form. They throw it away. So now I'm going to write to the parent company and make trouble for my old boss because he should have been smart enough to figure out how to do it right. Um, and yeah, I might even send him a nasty text message. Um, all right. Let's see here. Mr. Primack, you've got your hand up. Uh, yes. I, Comcast now has something called verified caller ID. Would you care to comment about that? Well, it's not from Comcast. Um, and I'm going to talk about this a little bit more in part two. Um, the FTC is the only agency that in some sense has responsibility for this problem. Um, the Federal Communications Commission pushed the various cell phone carriers to implement a method that is known by this crazy unwieldy acronym, acronym um, stir slash shaken. And essentially what it does is assign a digital certificate to every phone and, or every phone number. I'm not, I don't think it resides on the phone, but the, the point is that when a call originates, say on a, a T-Mobile phone, and it calls a Verizon phone. T-Mobile sends a digital certificate confirming that T-Mobile knows that the user of that number is, in fact, the owner of that number. Now, I'm going to show it to you in part two. It produces a little check mark by the phone number when the phone number calls you. Little In my case... Uh, it only started showing up in Android 13, which uh, for me means the last uh, five weeks. And I got the first call on December 28th. I had that little mark. I've gotten eight or 10 of them. I still don't answer. Now, why is that? Well, for one thing, it's not in my contacts list. So I don't know who's calling. For all I know, this is some scammer who's decided the only way he can get through is use a uh, uh, what you might call a legit phone number instead of something that's spoofed. Um, I also got one from a guy who I know. So it, it obviously works for people who are legit, but I can't, um, 
I can't say that it is 100% useful to me as a consumer because it doesn't give you a real caller ID. Now, having said that, there is another technique that Google has implemented, Google. And unfortunately, it comes with some very significant constraints. First of all, any, any company, any business that wants to be announced has to subscribe to the Google system. It's called Google Verified Calls. And it does a great job of shipping you the name of the business and why they're calling. So two text items come in with each call. They come in on the same screen that, sh that would pop up ordinarily announcing the call, except it only works if you as a consumer install an app called Google Phone. And I guess you have to somehow associate your phone number with that, that Google Phone app. I'm not really clear on it. Frankly, it was hard <laughs> to figure out that much about it. It is not documented well on the web. Um, but it looked like it's from the viewpoint of consumers, it's just about the best thing that could happen. Um, and I think it's a, a potentially a lot more useful than uh, the FCC system that was mandated. And just that alone, by the way, requires not only that the carriers implement it, but that the operating system on your phone, the phone app, implement it as well. And that's why, and although Verizon implemented it two years ago, I only got iOS 13 in early December. So um, it really depends on when, not, not just when uh, uh, the phone carrier implements it, but it also depends on when your operating system implements it on your phone. Yeah, that, um, that would be for the cell phones. I I have the Comcast phone, and it also uses the verified. Go ah, ahead. very good. Okay. Um, I no longer have access to the uh, – when I, when I bought into the Verizon – excuse me, the Verizon Fios um, internet service, they re required me – as a user of their landline service to switch to voice over IP. And I've never, I mean, I was getting so many uh, robocalls on that voice over IP system. I still pay for it, but I don't have any phone hooked up to it. Uh, the other thing that Comcast does is they offer for free normal robo. Okay. Well, I know people who have it on their landlines and they're telling me that it lets more and more stuff get through. And it's because it's blacklist based and there's nothing they can do to make it better than what it is, at least until they buy RoboKiller. Yeah, um, right. Right. And even then, <laughs> RoboKiller seems to be sort of in an early stage, maybe is the most charitable way to put it. And frankly, for the amount of money they charge, they ought to be way past the initial stage. AI is still learning. Well, AI is still learning. If you look at the way that AI works, it has to be learning constantly because the messages change constantly. Um, yeah, I, well, I could go on and on about that. I took a course in that about 30 years ago and I still remember enough of it to think this is definitely a work in progress. Uh, there's a couple of things, of course, that have, particularly the AI as a service has, has really made an impression on the general media, particularly because the service that writes essays has been seen as a threat by the education system. As, and frankly, I, you know, you can't sit there, first of all, the easiest thing to do is to tell people you throw this, throw your cell phone into the bucket every time you're, they're taking an essay test. Okay. That's the first thing. Um, but uh, writing an essay at home, what can you do about preventing that? Well, the real key here is if 25 kids in a class 
all if well let's say just be charitable and say half half of them hit the essay writer system is it going to produce the same essay every time and that's an interesting problem for the for the students because they'll get caught if it's the identical essay every time um, yeah i again that depends on how sophisticated the students are well and that really is sort of a test of their knowledge. It, it is in a sense, but it's also, how shall I put it, less, be, less than being entirely honest with their teacher. Um, so I don't view that ability to, let me back up a step, okay. The first computer science course I took in college was taught by a guy who had us write software for the third IBM 360 ever built. And I think he was particularly proud of having it there because he wrote the Fortran compiler for that machine. Got paid a lot of money by IBM for that. And he was so lousy at spelling that he actually told us he taught the compiler to accept nine different spellings of the word dimension. And if you know anything about Fortran, that's a pretty critical word. Um, anyway, he had a grading system, a, a sort of an executive on the IBM 360, and either the software you wrote would achieve the output he desired or it wouldn't. So it literally printed a printout for him, listed your name, and it either said yes or no. Except... In his textbook, he explained that he did this one year and one student, it came back with the word maybe. Hmm. That student actually hacked the executive, figured out how it worked and how to change the, the, the uh, range of outcomes. And he said he gave the, that he was the kind of teacher who would give the student an A for that, for hacking the executive. Yeah, well, anyway, with regard to robocalls, I, your point, I think, has been made about artificial intelligence and how it's not there yet. Yeah, and I'm not going to tell you that the operators, the owners of robocall systems are smart enough to find workarounds, but I honestly think the developers will recognize that as an issue and try to find various ways to work around it. It's sort of like the way that naval power developed during World War I, where people would build bigger guns and then the other side would put more armor on their ships and build bigger guns. And then the side that started it would put more armor on their ship and build even bigger guns and so forth. It's one of these spirals that doesn't end. And I think that's going to happen. Um, Okay, I think you've answered my question. Okay. I it's an interesting discussion, everybody. I will freely admit. I will uh, uh, remind everybody you're muted. Uh, uh, so if you uh, want to ask a question, make a comment, observation, uh, either press the space bar or uh, unmute your mic uh, icon in the bottom uh, left-hand side. Are there any further uh, questions or issues you want to bring up to John? Yeah, I, I do this kind of okay. uh, Hey, John, I, something I've experienced um, since the pandemic is, um, for instance, I have, I'm retired. I have my uh, IRA account with uh, you know, an investment company, and uh, they let all their, they used to have an office full of all these people. Now they let them all work from home. Hmm. I, I got called about test results from a lab, you know, for a medical testing. Person was calling from home. Hmm. So it's like I can't make a white list because I don't know all the whole phone numbers of all these people. So it, well, it seems like the pandemic has created something new here. I, I don't honestly think so. I think there's folks who are calling from home need to find a way and it might be Google verified calls need to find a way to give you some confidence 
about who's calling. Now, it may be now, and I, something else that I haven't even touched. What happens when one of your friends calls, you don't answer, and they get that voicemail that starts with the sit tones? Well, even if they don't leave a voicemail, you will see their name in recent calls. And they might leave a voicemail anyway because they, they listen past the three sit tones, which only last about a second. You'll hear your voice saying, no, my phone number is not disconnected. I just did that to deter robocallers. You can leave a message after the beep. And that's actually almost precisely what my own voicemail greeting says. And my friends have learned, even the ones who didn't leave a voicemail greeting the first time I called them back and I explained it. So it's really not, it doesn't have any long lasting adverse effects on people you want to call you. But yes, that, uh, that temporary dislocation, which might be permanent for stockbrokers and might not for physicians, um, that temporary dislocation has its own problems. And one of them is, what phone number do you use to communicate with the people you need to communicate with? They'll figure out some way to work it. I don't know what that way is at the moment, but they might end up spoofing. So it looks like it's coming from their office phone. So how do you, how do you do this uh, phone then? What, how is that generated? Uh, well, when I was researching all of this, and I realized the value of those sit tones, those the special information tones. I found websites that curate old recordings of special information. This number has been disconnected. This number is temporarily out of service. And I can't even remember all the others, but there's a zillion of them. Okay. And I downloaded one. I put it through some audio cleanup software on my computer and it's now posted on the web and in part two i will give you the download link so that you can obtain a really good high quality copy and you don't have to pay for it it's just up there and you you can download it you can have all your friends download it too for that matter um i don't get paid for these lectures i just feel it's important for people to understand that they are not at the mercy of the robocallers. You can do something about it and you don't have to pay RoboKiller or Nomo Robo. And it's fun. I talk about a lot, I, I, I mean, uh, Tim can tell you there, there's a number of different subjects that I offer because I do something like five or six presentations on new subjects for my own user group every year. And then we throw them into the list for other user groups to take advantage of. Um, so uh, anybody here a Mac user by any chance? I got a couple old Macs, but uh, uh, they're really dated. Uh, uh, I think okay. I'll tell you why I asked. Uh, in Part two, we're going to talk about how to unite a recording of your voice and the sit tones. And I use a free audio editor package called, called Audacity for that. And I will give you the URL and a QR code containing the URL so that you can download Audacity on your computer. But here in Northern Virginia, um, one, of, one of the clubs that I gave this presentation to, uh, the... Uh, the president of the club decided to use GarageBand, which is an app that ships with Mac computers. And it does the editing job just as well as Audacity if you already know how to use GarageBand. And if you don't, well, I'm gonna show you click by click how to use Audacity. And it runs on Mac and Linux and Windows. Um, and that's a little bit more of a preview that I intended. And we're already almost an hour and a half into this. Is there anybody else has a, uh, who has a question at this point? 
this is really weird. Okay. James has a TV running in the background and I, my eye, because it's moving, my eye keeps zip going to that TV. <laughs> um, that's the first time I've run into that. Although that airplane is kind of cool too. I admit it. Um, let's see here. I don't know. I can't, uh, I'm, I'm a little bit, I'm, I'm, Run down a little bit. My voice is a bit dry. But if y'all do have any other questions, I'll be happy to deal, deal with them as best I can. Excellent presentation. You're very welcome. Uh, sometime yeah, in the next- Excellent presentation. He's right. Uh, thank you. Um, sometime in the next 48 hours, I will send a PDF copy of it to Tim. And in that PDF copy, every link that I showed you will be live. That is, you can bring the PDF up, click on the blue link, and it'll take you to the web page. So Thank you. if Thank you, you. Can't, can't learn how to scan between now and then, you can go use them anyway. <laughs> um, uh, and um, I hope you all will join us on Saturday. Uh, it would be fun to see you. And then uh, we're also having another presentation on Saturday. One of our club members recently bought an all-electric car, and he didn't just buy it. He drove it to California and back. And he's going to talk about what it takes to do long-distance travel in an all-electric car. Wow. It's a very interesting subject. Uh, I have a hybrid with a, a, a modest 12 mile range on its battery. And uh, there was a time when, I don't know if it made much of a dent in the general media where you are, but uh, there were, there's a pipeline that comes from Texas refineries called uh, Colonial, yeah. yeah, business name that operates it. And there was a period of like eight or nine days when uh, Colonial was unable to ship any uh, gasoline to the East Coast. And I ran my car in electric power. Now, admittedly, I didn't try to go to Baltimore, which is 30 miles, or Richmond, which is 100 miles, but I could go buy groceries. Um, so from my viewpoint, at least for local travel, it worked pretty well. And I, if you have uh, a Kia with a bigger battery or um, uh, one of the uh, Tesla machines with the uh, 200 mile range. Hey, wouldn't put much of a dent in you at all, as long as the electricity stayed on. Um, so these times are coming. Uh, we, we, many of us know that we'll be dealing eventually, and many states have already made it public policy. It, it's built into their law that cars sold after less than such a date must be electric powered only. So uh, it's fun to learn about it now, but it will be mandatory. Not terribly there. far in the future. I've been there. I had a Tesla. And people don't realize if you have problems, particularly uh, uh, wrecks or damage, it is, it is terrible. People don't realize that. The other issue well, was range anxiety. So I got rid of it. I now I have a RAV4. It's got about 40 to 50 miles battery. So I run most of the time on that, but on, on the highway, I can go 500 miles on gas. Yes. And um, when mine was new, uh, now this is the second Prius I've owned. Um, the first one was a, a standard Prius in 2005, and I had that for 10 years. This one I've had for eight years, and it's what's called it. It's now sold under the name Prius Prime. It used to be sold under the name Prius Plug-in. And when it was new, I was getting about 55 a gallon, which is about 10% more than I ever got in the 2005 Prius. Uh, I had some bad luck with that car. It got hit a few times. And not that it, it did anything that was seriously damaging uh, the batteries or whatever, but it's not... It's not running at peak efficiency anymore. One of the things that they don't tell you about these things is eventually some of the cells inside the battery will degrade. Yeah. 
And my battery is all in one place and it's serviceable. Um, but there were some models of Tesla where the batteries were spread all over the body of the vehicle. And there are other companies that are at least prototyping batteries built into the frame. Mm -hmm. And that strikes me as being the least serviceable approach. Um, there are other companies that are prototyping an effort that instead of having you wait half an hour to charge your battery, um, they will literally replace it. Hmm. Pull yours out and put in a freshly charged one. And they charge you, you know, they charge you for that service. Uh, but that means you don't sit very long as long as they don't have a waiting line. Um, Tesla has been very aggressive about building a huge number of uh, charging stations in any given location. I went to the, uh, went up I-95 a couple of years ago from Washington up through Delaware to uh, ultimately to Boston. But you stop at the Delaware, the, the stretch in, in, in Delaware is about 20 miles and there's one rest stop. Um, and they had 12 Tesla chargers built in. And I thought that was pretty intelligent. Um, the, problem, the problem with those, the only person that can use those right now are the people that have a Tesla because it's a totally different yeah. connector and, and it's I high, tell you, high voltage. I have the, the typical J connector that everything from Asia uses. And I am well aware that I can't charge it at a Tesla spot. Now, there's a, there is a remote state park in West Virginia that I go to. It's near the place where my dad was born and he used to take us every there, there every year for vacation. And they have installed chargers. Three of them are Tesla and one for the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. So if that one is being used, I have to wait. Now, I tend, it's a mountainous area. I tend not to drive on battery up there because it's gonna use, I mean, I lose the range very quickly. The 12 mile range becomes maybe an eight mile range. But uh, you have to learn about these things. As you say, there's some very expensive things that have to be done in order to cure the damage, but even routine maintenance is very interesting. Most of the people employed for routine maintenance at car dealers of vehicles are gonna lose their jobs because most of it's associated with an internal combustion engine. And when those are history, those, those guys are gone. Now, admittedly, there'll probably be some third party organization that will hire them just to service the remaining vehicles that are still on the road using internal combustion engines. But uh, for the environment, is it really a better thing to have all of the power coming through wires? Most people don't realize that on the way to the end user, about two thirds of the available current is burned up through resistance in the delivery lines, the, the network that we have. And uh, it strikes me that it's probably time to find a better way. Um, Guys, the gas company is not gonna let this thing go easy. I'm not sure that I am convinced that they are in a position to make that reality stick for much longer. And one of the reasons is there's going to be class action suits that sue them for all the lung diseases associated with air pollution. And not only that, there's an article in the paper today here in Washington about um, water pollution involving Forever. The acronym is PF A or PFAS. PFAS. And I can't remember what it stands for, but it's one of those chemicals. Polychlorinated that, uh, and their organic it, compounds. It's uh the la the A stands for acid, which is bad enough. Yeah. Uh, the S stands for sulfonic. Yeah. And uh sooner or later, somebody uh from my viewpoint, some 
smart lawyer is going to find a way to do a massive class action suit. And frankly, I think the oil companies, as, as much money as they have, they can afford good legal representation. But when they're looking at a trillion dollars in damages, I kind of think they're going to have to settle it quickly. Because, and because, frankly, if it goes to court and, and somebody wins a trillion dollars against them, they're out of business. They're problem, gone. The problem, the problem you have is all the products that come out of petroleum, for instance, the asphalt, instead of having asphalt, you're going to have to use concrete. And are you familiar with the concrete industry? You know, the uh, pal signers for creating the, the concrete are big polluters. The other issue is all the chemicals, all the plastics all come out of the petroleum. So where are you going to get the, the for that? You got well, propane, butane, I, all that. Thanks. I am not arguing that I have any answers. What I'm arguing is that the folks who are invested in the petroleum industry have a problem on their hands that is growing very, very quickly. Uh, Some the, of them the obviously know it, but none of them are actually doing anything to shift away from it. Well, the thing is, uh, the petrochemical industry isn't really part of the discussion about cars. I, the power grid is, and the sources from the power grid yep. are the main yep. discussion. And right now in the Northeast, for example, we get uh, probably more than half, maybe as much as two thirds of our electricity from burning natural gas. Uh, and I can tell you in that the county where my dad was born, uh, one of the big employers there has always been coal mm -hmm. and the the local power plant there burns two million tons of coal per year work it out it's fifteen thousand tons a day and they have trains and trucks delivering it constantly from the local um mines now having said that the number of employees per mine has gone down for reasons that neither President Trump or anybody else can control, and that is it's cheaper and safer to mine with large machines than it is to mine with people with shovels. So the, uh, they have found that even with the required maintenance on those machines, those mines em employ far fewer, I mean, maybe 10% of the people who were employed there 40 years ago. Um, now, still, um, one thing that my son pointed out to me, people don't realize this. There's a lot of impurities in coal. The phrase clean coal is an oxymoron. And you'd be surprised at how much radioactive junk is in coal. And coal, coal fired plants put out far, far more radioactivity than nuclear plants. Wow. Uh, people freak out about nuclear plants, but um, the only thing that really is, aside from the safety issues, the only thing that's really a downside at, at solid fuel plants that we use now is that those rods are declared declare depleted when the fuel is reduced by 2%, yeah. which means 98% of the enriched uranium is still in the fuel rod. There are some techniques that were developed in the 1950s at Oak Ridge to produce liquid fueled reactors that not only are far safer than the current uh, water-cooled solid fuel reactors, but on top of that, when the fuel is depleted, it's 100% depleted. Guess who, the, guess who the patron was for that work? The U.S. Air Force. They were so jealous of the nuclear subs that could stay on station for months at a time that they wanted a reactor they could put on an aircraft. And that's where the effort came from, the effort to build these compact liquid reactors that could produce gigawatts of electricity for the uh, aircraft. There were reasons why the Air Force eventually backed away from it, but... Uh, 
Yeah, there are, there are also more advanced designs now than there were before, and designs that reduce the human element. Which yes, is how you get to all these accidents. Yes, um, one of the things that has never been very clear to most of the public is that what happens when a water cooled reactor when the circulation pumps stop working and it happens at Fukushima uh, Fukushima Daiichi those pumps were powered by wires from another reactor 75 miles away and it happened the other reactor wasn't affected by the earthquake but the lines came down and that's why the circulation system stopped in the Fukushima Daiichi reactors and what happens when they stop is that the water keeps heating and eventually the heat breaks it into hydrogen and oxygen yeah this and was yes, a, this was the same concern they had in Ukraine when the electricity went out to one of their big Zaporizhzhi uh, reactors uh, the Ukraine system situation really had more to do with a test that was being run by the Russian uh, authorities high up in the, the, the energy administration. They were running a test where they literally. No, no, I wasn't out. talking about Chernobyl. I'm talking about the current Ukraine war. Ah, the, you know, the war is a different circumstance. You're right. Where You're right. there was a danger from the power being cut to the region. Yeah, yeah very true. Chernobyl was uh, a totally different thing. Chernobyl was, was one of the most monumental acts of idiocy in all of the Soviet Union's history. It, I meant, well, admittedly, uh, yeah, it was 86. Yeah. It was still the Soviet Union. Um, yeah, it was. But, th but that, th that the was people who actually <laughs> operated the reactor knew exactly what was going to happen. Yep. Yep. And the idiots who came in and ran the test had never actually operated a reactor before. Yeah, that was the human element. Yeah. But mm -hmm. uh, anyway, I I have a question. Do we have other computer topics we want to talk about? <laughs> well, I think I don't have one. anything else to do tonight. It, well, I have to go buy a couple of things that I forgot at the grocery but, store. But because uh, I did want to bring up one thing, I a very practical matter about Macron Reflect. I. I'm sorry, you're using a phrase there that I'm not sure I'm familiar with. Backroom Reflect, a uh, backup I, program? No, I haven't, I haven't heard of that. Oh, okay. Well, I do backups to multiple hard drives and a NAS. Okay. That makes sense. And All the right. stuff That's that right. I mainly back up is my photographs, to be yeah. honest. But I, I, I'm talking about backup and recovery software because we in the, com in the Chicago Computer uh, Society have been talking about this transition that is going on with one of the big backup programs. So oh. Macrim Reflect Free is uh, kind of going away and it's going to become perhaps a, a subscription model so that there's only going to be a paid edition. You know, There are, there are free alternatives. It's, but, it's, I, <sighs> but I did have an item about that that I wanted to make sure we cover. Well, and, gosh, uh, guys, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I'll learn I, something. I mean, unless there's more that we need uh, to hear from John. I have obviously rambled on a bit. I, I Sometimes when I introduce myself at user groups, I say my motto is never one word when five will do. But in any event, John, I would like to thank you. You've done a very good job. I, very informative. Um, nice job. Good job. The... Uh, I, I have an interest in the way that the subscription model has kind of mushroomed in the computer industry. Um, I put a lot of money into Adobe after I, I bought the subscription version of Photoshop and Photoshop has been a tremendous help to me. Uh, I, I enter several photo contests a year. Um, I also, See if I have any examples that are out here. This is, I also have been for 12 years publishing a custom photo calendar. This is an example, and it's month per page. So I have photographs on the top, 
and then I have the calendar grid for a month beneath it. Um, I teach a course on how to do this as well, and I have put the blanks the, uh, with the month filled in and the federal holidays filled in, um, but no photos. I put those up on the web for people to download for free. I've been doing that for four or five years. Um, so I'm about to announce the availability of the 2024 files. Um, and uh, Photoshop has made all that stuff look like a million bucks. I've been so grateful um, for Photoshop. And yes, from my viewpoint, spending what I spend, uh, it's $10 a month, 120 a year. And I get all the updates. For me, that's been, uh, I couldn't afford to spend $700 on Photoshop like one of my friends did. And then find out two years later that I wasn't getting any updates. Um, but everybody else tried to get on that bandwagon. So Microsoft with its 365 initiative. Um, and I use a video editor that used to be published by Sony. It's now published by Magic's digital video editor. And they go on that route and everybody else thinks it's a way for, you know, establish a steady income stream. Um, I still do everything I can to make people aware that they can accomplish a whole lot with free software. Mm -hmm. Free software can still accomplish so much. You just have to know how to use it and you know why you might want to use it in the first place. Anyway, that's my soapbox about that. I think too many companies have decided to go the subscription route because it looks like it would keep them with a steady income stream. And I think they've misunderstood the market fundamentally, particularly for the less expensive. I mean, Photoshop is one thing. It, it had a very high price, but things that only cost 80 bucks or 100 bucks Charging a subscription fee for that forever is just, I think, nuts. Anyway, um, so uh, please go ahead with your discussion because I, you know, I'll yeah, sit there, back. There was, and, just, there was just one thing that I wanted to, uh, an observation about something that happened uh, today, well, this month with Macroom Reflect. The free edition did get an update. Mm -hmm. And the paid edition did not get that update. Hmm. The way I got it was I downloaded the free edition in the new version, installed it as an upgrade, and that put me in with the free edition again. I had copied out my license key from the paid upgrade, and I just plugged that in again. And now I've got the paid edition in the updated version. And what's in the update, I think there are some interface changes and some improvements in how I, it estimates the transfer rate of the data. Because I previously, the program had had some difficulties I, due to the fact that it wasn't taking the compression into consideration properly. And I think they corrected that to some extent. So the free edition has gotten an update. I don't know how many more updates it'll get before it goes away. Now, what are you paying, Bob, for the... For the well, I got the Black Friday deal. I got the Black Friday deal, so it was less oh, okay. than $20 per license. I got the four pack. I think it was about $17, $18 per license. But I don't know how long that license will last because it will yeah. eventually go over to a subscription. Yeah. Okay. Hey, hey Bob. Well, on the maximum reply <coughs> site, is it then your your it's the thirty day trial that you're downloading? Because I can't no. see the free edition. I the only way to get the free edition now is to go to third party sites. Oh, so I, the Wikipedia that uh, Tim told me about last week. That's one site. That's one. Okay. I don't know if they have the very latest version upgrade, but uh, that's the only place I've seen the absolutely free version. Okay. 
I eventually it will stop getting updates. But so far, it got one on January 12th. That was all I was saying. What, what website did you find that had this latest? Uh, I don't recall. In Google, it was one of the first ones that talked about. Let me look it up again. And meanwhile, people can continue with whatever they want to uh, be talking about. Does anybody else have any uh, uh, questions or issues? I had problems tonight about three times I got picked off. I couldn't figure out whether it was on my end or at your end. It wasn't Okay, I I have the the site where I got it from. I uh, there is a site called TechSpot. Mhm. Mm and 6 days ago they got the update. Major Geeks also I think has the current update. A T E C H S P O T I suggest that you copy it into chat so people can see. I will indeed open it up and then copy the URL. And this will be specifically to get to exactly where it is. Chat. There it is. As far is. as uh, uh, Wayne, uh, uh, you get knocked off uh, per se. Something tells me that has to do something with the internet uh, and I may be Oh, crap, but uh, uh, I noticed no problem here. Uh, Dennis uh, L on uh, uh, the screen right now, he's tried to come up with video umpteen times and it's yep. been uh, atrocious. Now you're coming clear for the time being, but now it just yeah, went bad. Yeah, there, yeah. And that may be internet too, I'm not sure, or it could be an overloaded uh, uh, computer. Well, Dennis is coming in kind of fuzzy and then going out. Yeah. In terms of the video. Yeah, that that suggests a, a low upload rate on his uh, internet That's service right. provider. But That's right. there, there's some other things like like uh, Tim said, if he has a lot of other stuff running on the machine, that can be a problem. Uh, I went. You know, I I know when people invite me to speak, they're depending on me not to be interrupted by issues like that. And I um, have learned on this Windows 11 box that I'm using that if it starts to exhibit upload speed issues, I have to reboot and that clears it up. Uh, so I know it's something in the machine and I no longer leaving it running for 30 days at a time. Um, but uh, it's just one of those learning things. Also, um, Zoom is now up to, I. It's now up to version point, uh, point 0.5. Oh, 13.5. Yeah. Uh, so, I, I actually installed it this morning. They tend to update every Monday, yeah. although it's not every Monday. There's some Mondays when there's nothing new available. Right, right. Um, and... Uh, 5.13.5. Yeah. As far as I can tell, although they may have dropped some features... I haven't seen anything that has gotten broken by their updates. Um, yeah, they're, they're pretty good about that. Yeah. I think they do a fair amount of testing and maybe have some beta testers too. Um, Who knows? <laughs> one of the things that showed up tonight, which I have never seen before, is a list of apps on the far right side. Um, yeah, I they knew, had those. I, I knew they did, but it's the first time I've seen it is what yeah, I'm saying. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I, um, back when the pandemic hit, our, our club has been using Zoom since 2012, and we have occasional Zoom presenters, uh, and we have some members that are as far away as, as North Dakota, but, uh, they used to live here, but when they left, they decided they would, uh, stay, uh, as members of the club because they could watch the, the presentation. Um, and I had never heard of Zoom before I walked into their meetings uh, back in 2016, I think. So it was fun for me to learn when the pandemic came along and we couldn't meet because our, our landlord is at the local university and they just said, nope, nobody comes on campus. Um, 
we all had to learn Zoom in a hurry. And I was actually writing docs and getting them published for uh, the rest of our club to use. And I probably turned out one or two new docs per day. And do you know that two universities adopted those docs? One of them was our landlord, George Mason University. And the other one, oddly enough, I know you can't see it, but I'm wearing a Virginia Tech shirt. The other one was <laughs> Virginia Tech. And they asked for the docs. And when they found out that the, the author was a, an alumnus, they were overjoyed. Mm -hmm. um, so that was kind of fun. Uh, the docs are way, I mean, I haven't been updating them. They're way out of date now. But um, the fundamental features of Zoom strike me as being extremely valuable. And uh, there's one club. Now I'm not sure where they're located. But I, I did a presentation for them last week. And they used, this is the weirdest experience I've ever run into while I've been in the Speakers Bureau. They use an app called Free Conference Call. It is remarkably like Zoom. But the weirdest part is that there's another conferencing app, get this, called Free Conference. And the leader of the club sent me a link for free conference instead of free conference call. So, of course, I couldn't connect to it. Mm -hmm. Eventually, he figured it out. But I know enough about corporate law in the United States that I am absolutely astounded that any state would allow free conference and free conference call to coexist under those names. There's state trademark laws and there's state corporation laws that would strongly suggest that that should not exist. That confusion should not exist. Um, now, see, the weirdest part about that is those members of those clubs, if they want to see the APC UG Wednesday workshop, they have to know Zoom anyway. They have to have it installed. Yeah. So why is their club using a different thing? Well, the basic answer most of the time is, the club didn't try to get a free educational license. Mm -hmm. And they thought the expense was unbearable. Okay, fine. But almost every club is an approved 501c3 organization and has the papers to show to Zoom so that they can get an educational license. They just didn't think of it. Yeah. That's all. That includes us. Well, I belong to a user group that does Linux and uh, open source, and they are using Jitsi Meet. And that just simply works through your browser as though it's part of your browser. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of things that I, other things that I've used, and, and frankly, Google Voice works through the web very nicely, if that's what you need. Um, I don't know if Google Phone does, but Google Voice does. And um, I haven't had much use for it, but I'll tell you why I have it. It brings, another, brings up another subject that I teach called Ever Lost Your Phone. Mm -hmm. um, let's see if I can do this right. Okay. This is the lock screen. On, <sighs> doesn't like to stay on very much. I don't know if you can see that. Um, but the message on the lock screen gives you a phone number to call if you found this phone. That phone number is my Google Voice number, and I can access that using a web page. Um, so if I lose my phone and somebody who I would characterize as a good Samaritan finds it, they call that number or they send an email to the email that's on that screen. I'll know it and I can answer it. Um, of course, Good Samaritans aren't the only people that might have your phone when you lose it. Um, but there's other technologies that you can use, like Find My Phone for Apple. Um, and there's a similar feature for Android. So uh, those are all things that are very valuable if you're ever concerned about losing these things. Um, 
When I lose it in my house, I just call it using Google Voice and it rings so I can find it. Um, anyway, uh, folks, I think I've overstayed my welcome. It's, it's now nine o'clock in your time and 10 o'clock here. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut out and you guys can uh, stay as long as you wish for yourselves. I am very glad that you invited me. I have spent some time in Chicago in the past, and I think it's a wonderful place, at least the parts that I've seen. Um, one of these days I want to get back. I want to uh, go a little bit east around Lake Michigan and then shoot a picture of the city uh, just after sunset with uh, some light in the sky behind the, the buildings. I think it's a wonderful uh, urban uh, skyline. I uh, remember when I was in college, I drove out there. Let's see here. That was right after exams finished in 1973. And I shot a photograph that I still think is one of my best uh, from, I think it was the Standard Oil Building at night. Uh, their, their observation uh, floor had a terrific view that included what was then known as the Sears Tower, as well as the uh, Hancock Tower. Um, yeah, those were good times. I, uh, we, we drove out on an unbelievably snowy day uh, from Boston. And I managed to spin out the car on the New York State Thruway, which had uh, an inch of packed snow on it. Then we drive by Lake Erie. Yeah. And we can't see anything because there's six feet of snow, which is higher than the Corvair that we were driving. So I couldn't see the lake. I couldn't see anything else. Oh, well. Um, and, and then uh, from after a couple of days in Chicago, I went out to see my best buddy from high school. He lived in Minneapolis and I flew home on the 24th and, and the plane went, I think there was, there were actually more uh, crew on the plane than passengers, which meant they were handing out alcohol for free. And um, we flew right over Michigan Avenue with all those lights. And I was just so thrilled to see that from the sky looking down on that. Um, so, um, you know, for my money, Chicago is still a cool place and I'm, I'm glad I got to know a little bit of it. Anyway, have fun and I'll, uh, maybe I'll, well, I will definitely talk to you from a month from now. Okay. Bye-bye. Thanks for coming. Thank you very much. Uh, anybody got anything else uh, for tonight? Otherwise, uh, we'll see each other the 21st of next month for part two. And probably various meetings in between. Well, uh, remember, Thursday night's uh, Ed Keating's meeting, and uh, next Tuesday will be Lennox. There we are. And uh, then you, we start February with uh, uh, West Side, then Tips and Tricks, etc., all over again. All right. Okay. I'm going to call it a, a, a night. Yeah. <laughs>